Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Juma Mubarak and Ramadan Mubarak to everybody, whether you're here in the space with it, uh, with us, or if you are uh, here uh, seeing this virtually or anywhere you may be, inshallah. Uh, it's a blessing to be here with you all. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'ufuduhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina min sayyati amalina. من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم All praise due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leads astray no one can guide I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is his servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah and uh, in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission and mindfulness to Allah. I pray that my uh, chest is open, that my task is made easy, and that the knot of my tongue is loosened by Allah, and that my speech may be understood. Glory be to you, Allah. We have no knowledge except that which you have taught us. Verily, it is you who are the all-knowing and the all-wise. Assalamu alaikum again uh, to everyone. It's such a blessing to be able to be with you during this blessed month of Ramadan and to be here uh, in your presence, whether you are seeing this live, inshallah, or whether you are seeing this in the future at some time. Uh, salam to you. So the title of this khutbah, inshallah, was on the, the topic of a very trending and popular TV show called The Last of Us. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick brief summary and segue into this, but spoiler alert, if you have not, uh, if you need to leave the room, inshallah, you can, but otherwise, uh, yalla tafadl. So The Last of Us is a TV show currently, you know, in its iteration, but it's a TV show adaptation of a video game. Uh, it's a comes from a very highly acclaimed video game, not, you know, because of its, uh, its gameplay, but is more so because of its story, uh, because of the nuance, the character development, and so on and so forth. Um, and this story, The Last of Us, takes place in a post-apocalyptic world, uh, version of our world here, uh, 20 years after being ravaged by a pandemic that started in 2003. So it takes place in the same kind of year that we're in, but uh, is set in a much different environment. They, they also experienced a global pandemic, but it looked a little bit different. Uh, and this global pandemic was caused by a fungal infection, and it wiped out most of the Earth's population. Uh, but it infected many others, infected in ways that essentially turned them into zombies, you know, walking dead and such. But it's left this world that has now no formal order, no official governments. Uh, there's outside of a few militaristic groups or revolutionary folks or raiders, bandits, resistance movements, you know, and, and people more nomadic. It's a very dismantled society. It's it's not connected in any way. It's a it's a dog eat dog world, to say the least. And our main characters in the story are Joel and Ellie. Joel, who also happens to be from Austin, Texas, has made his way to Boston, um, where uh, with his brother, um, who now since the outbreak of uh, 20 years ago, he's doing what he can to survive. He's doing what he can to survive as a smuggler, um, and having kind of taken that route through the United States as it was being ravaged. So Joel is a seasoned adult, um, but he's experienced tremendous loss in the wake of that outbreak. And since then, uh, most notably his teenage daughter who passed away and was killed before, and is now in a time where his brother, Tommy, who accompanied him through this post-apocalyptic world has also left and kind of been out of reach. And on the other hand, we have Ellie, who is a teenager. She's orphaned at birth and she was born after the outbreak, she lives within and is born within the confines of a quarantine zone that's also in Boston. And the life inside these walls is all that she knows. But Ellie is special. She, uh, that in, in despite being, being infected, she'd been bit, that despite being infected, she's not turned or she's not been truly infected in a sense. She's, she's not a zombie. And she only has a scar as a result. 
And so her condition, this, this aspect of this, piques the interest of those who are in the resistance movement that is a part of a larger network and thinking about that this might be what she's got. This may be some kind of a cure. She may have an antidote. She may have some kind of uh, preventative that can help and cure the people who are already infected or even protect those who may become infected later on. So hence the last of us sets place in this in this aspect of this this world and Joel and Ellie's paths then get crossed in a very fateful yet kind of odd way when he plans to go find his brother out west that I haven't heard from him in a while I'm, I'm going to go out and, and and find him and in a tense negotiation with the leader of the resistance who has uh, kind of held Ellie under house arrest just kind of seeing that this is an infected person but is also not turning so something's interesting about this and he agrees to take Ellie out west with him, but as cargo, as transportation. He, she's, she's just a package that needs to be delivered from point A to point B. And uh, you know, she's to be taken in this sense to respective scientists, doctors, whoever out west, and hopefully they can find a cure. But this is, uh, in this space now, the journey truly begins. The last of us truly begin. Uh, in this aspect, Joel and Ellie are embarking out west, they're embarking out west in a world in which no one really knows what might be on the horizon. You have Joel on one hand, who is, as we mentioned, is a seasoned traveler. He's come from Austin. He has uh, seen and experienced much of that which one can probably expect in the wilderness that you can describe of this world. And Ellie, on the other hand, has not. Outside of an incident of which she was infected, she's not seen or known life or about whatever might lie ahead outside of those walls and is going into this world unaware of what might even come. Yet their relationship is one with one another that is not of friends, but at that point it's transactional. As Joel reminds her early on in the journey that to him, she's just cargo that needs to be transported in order for him to be able to get uh, whatever he had been negotiated with. But as the story progresses, we see how these two characters, vastly different from each other in many different respects, come to fill a void in each other's life. For Joel, his teenage daughter who was killed at the beginning of the onset of this pandemic, and for Ellie, a parent who she never knew. And their bond grows through this adversity they experience together. And in the buildup to this point, however, I stop at the crescendo of the storyline where Joel and Ellie, they've made it out west, and in coming to what is intended to be a destination for Ellie, they're ambushed. Joel is badly wounded. He's stabbed. And in the next leg of their journey, as they're moving on from this place, Joel collapses off of their, their horse. And he's holding on for dear life. Distraught, Ellie jumps off the horse and says, I can't do this without you. Wake up, Joel. I can't do this without you. The story doesn't end there, of course, but it's a telling moment. Now, why did I start my chutbah in Ramadan of all months talking about a story that I encountered in a show on HBO Max? It doesn't seem even remotely connected to Islam, to Ramadan, or to spiritual journeys to connect to the divine, does it? Yet in the persons, in the stories, in the relationship and the friendship of Joel and Ellie and in the traveling, we may be able to see more than we'd take at surface value. Going into Ramadan, having now been you know, going on a day, you know, going in two days in, how many of us came into Ramadan seasoned? Seasoned like Joel, having an idea of what to expect. We kind of have our path, our journey, our even our destination. You know, we're, we're going towards Eid. Uh, we're going to go through, you know, the valley and the, the heights of Laylatul Qadr we're gonna, and, and, and the last 10 days. We're going to go through these different parts um, and, and had this, this kind of Ramadan generally plotted out because we've traveled it before. And how many of us, came into Ramadan, much like Ellie, having never experienced it before, or feeling very new and fresh out of water, having been born into this world, yet never having actually gone outside those walls, hearing only a few things, but never having actually embarked on that journey. What we come to see in The Last of Us is that whatever our skills were or are, and how we came into Ramadan, especially if we've come through before, we can never fully prepare ourselves for the times, whether spiritually or worldly, in which that rug might be pulled out from under our feet, and we might be left feeling lost, whether in our spiritual spaces or in our worldly spaces. And so we might think 
that for this journey, we're self-sufficient, like Joel. We know what to expect, and yet not realize how instrumental, how important having someone to walk alongside us is, especially those who may be newer to this path, newer to this journey, that they remind us of how we can not only be better versions of our past, but also of our future selves to come going forward. And we might be like Ellie, who embarking on this journey, albeit without much agency of her own in doing so, uncertain of the path ahead, putting their trust in others, yet not fully certain of what they're capable on their own, not fully certain of what she might possess in the sense of being able to survive. Time and time again in this story, these two came to the aid of one another, not just saving each other's lives, but what we've come to see helping each other grow as human beings. When we embark on this journey of Ramadan, we might do so isolated, we might do it on our own, but we might also do it with other people. And yet we still might be isolated within that social bubble, unaware of the needs of others who might not have the same privilege of experiencing Ramadan how we are. Or we might also be blind to our own needs. What are, what are our needs if we are just looking out for the collective and just moving with whatever the pack does? So not just Ramadan per se, but thinking about this in the spiritual journey of life, in the spiritual journey of Islam itself. As a community, we are diverse in our colors and our tongues and our backgrounds. We are also diverse in our experiences on the spectrum of faith. Yet what we stand to lose might be much more than what we stand to gain by surrounding ourselves only with those who are like us. In the spirit of the last of us, as a community, an ummah made up of variety of different moving, unique parts, we move through our spiritual journeys and we begin this journey anew again in Ramadan. We may start it like Joel and think that we know what is best because this is our 10th Ramadan, 20th, 30th, 50th, inshallah, more uh, Ramadan and, and, and not you know, see how those who are just starting it, this is maybe their first, second or third, or you know, it, it may be halfway that they discovered this is the first Ramadan, that it might not occur to us that how those who are just starting this journey can be a saving grace for us, especially when that journey takes an unexpected turn. Those of us who start like Ellie, we might not be, we might not be uh, sure of where we can now go. We might not be sure of how we can go through this journey with a stranger, yet we lean on the experience and the hope that this person will help us get to the destination that we need, while also not being aware of how not only are we being taught by this person, but in many ways, we're teaching them. So yet when Ellie says, faced with the very real possibility that Joel may not be on this journey with her anymore. He's facing death. She's maybe considering the possibility she might have to do this on her own. And she says, I can't do this without you. I can't do this alone. I think about our tradition. I think about those who walked and showed the path of true faith, those who are the pious predecessors, the prophets, the sages, the people who came before us, destined for the divine, yet trailblazers in their own respect who are seen as the forerunners of faith. I think about our Prophet sitting by Khadija, who's his anchor, his rock, his, his wife, his, his trusted confidant, and so much more, as she is passed away, as she dies in that space in home, holding her hand and maybe thinking, I can't do this without you. I think about him again, I think about our Prophet shortly after he's sitting at the bedside of Abu Talib for his last breaths, someone who's like a father for him, someone who had supported him, who had uh, been such a, uh, a, a, a shield for him in such an adverse environment. And I think of him thinking at that bedside, saying, thinking, I can't do this without you. I can't do this. Alone. And I think about our Prophet again sitting under the shade of a tree outside Ta'if. Shoes are filled with blood, rejected by his own countrymen, rejected by people of another town where he may have found some refuge, thinking, I can't do this without you. It's thinking to God, speaking directly. I can't do this without you. I can't do this alone. Yet, what the Prophet Sallallahu and similarly Ali may not have thought would be possible. We would later see that not only were they in fact capable, but because of those who walked alongside them, they actually became better for it. And they actually learned 
to then become even better in their own respects. When looking at this from our faith perspective, we see that in moments of tremendous loss, these moments of despair, these feelings of abandonment, when all of the world seems to have left us, that when the last of us truly seems to have left us alone, that in that moment, in that space, in that isolation, Allah remains. Allah reminds us in the Quran, Kullu man fan, wajuhu rabbika. Indeed, everything on this earth, everything in existence and creation will truly come to pass. It will perish. It will vanish. It's not permanent. It will disappear. And only Allah will remain. The last. Al-Akhir. And in these moments, feeling like they are the end of our own rope, they are the end of our journey, that they are that, the last, we see that Allah, in fact, not only never left, but Allah is that which is continuous, that who is continuous, and never abandoned us in that space, that the person, the worldly thing might have disappeared, that loved one may have disappeared. Allah was always there. Allah reminds us in Surah Duha, Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Your Lord has not forsaken you, nor your Lord has your Lord abandoned you. Always been there since the beginning. And we then see at these pivotal moments that those who came before us truly became who they were and who we know them for because of this lesson learned. In the story of The Last of Us, Ellie came and comes to become somebody who was much more capable, much more than just capable, and in fact helped to save Joel's life because of it. The story goes on, inshallah, we'll, we don't have to conclude here, but as a community, as an ummah, as we embark on this journey, not just within our own faith, but with respect to this timely month of Ramadan, let us do what Allah has called for us to do during this month on this journey, that particularly as we are fasting day in, day out, we are going from point A to point B with each and every fast, that first and foremost to be mindful and to remember Allah, that we should do our best to not do so alone. We should do our best to do so in a way that that allows us to be mindful of those who have the means and the experience or the seasoning, to be of those who may have this experience, to be vigilant of those who do not, to be helpful for those who are not in that space, but also for those who may be isolated, for those who may be new, to be aware and to not be afraid to ask for help. That we might have those sisters or brothers who might be isolated. That we might have those sisters or brothers who might be uh, that that might be going on this journey alone. For those of us who are experienced, for those of us for whom this is not the case, for whom we are blessed to have other people with us, or we are blessed to be a part of a community, bring them along with us, take them alongside us, walk alongside, because they must, they may have, and they probably do have much more to teach us than we can ever teach them. And for those of us who may start new, don't be afraid to ask out to reach out for help, to ask for help, or to lean on somebody for this new journey. Yet, what we're reminded of, inshallah, in conclusion, both in our tradition and from the story we've talked about today, the other person, the co-traveler, the person who walks rank and file next to us and helps us get through the journey, the person that we walk alongside with in trust and in faith, at the end of the day, is also just a person. They are a finite human being. And they are not to become the object of focus in our journeys. They are not to become the reason why we walk. They're not to even become the GPS that guides us in this journey or any of this aspect that connotates that this person is our everything, that we put all our eggs in the basket uh, of this person, that nothing would be possible if this person was not here, that we see within our tradition our destination is and always has been Allah. Our purpose is for this cognizance or this recognition, this mindfulness, remembering of Allah. And our GPS, particularly in this month of Ramadan, Allah tells us in his own divine speech that our GPS is the Quran itself, which was revealed in this month. And that we walk, we walk alongside this aspect. We fast, fast for no other reason other than to be aware of Allah. Fast for no other reason than to be mindful of Allah and to walk in an aspect of tawakkul, to walk in an aspect of putting that faith, putting that trust 
wholeheartedly in Allah. That because as Allah tells us, in Allah yuhibbil mutawakkili. Allah loves those who put their faith and their trust in Allah. So put your faith and your trust in Allah. It does not mean we don't bring companions along with us. You actually bring them along with you for the purpose of enriching that journey. But when they become the focus is when we need to remind ourselves that any, anything in this world, our own abilities, whether it is you know, our able-bodiedness or any uh, advantage or anything that we have, these are all amana. These are all blessings. These are trusts that have been given to us and that we are not walking for them. We are not worshiping them. That our, our faith does not bank on just this one aspect or this one person or whatever it may be, but that taking the benefit, taking the reminder that these benefits that we have, these people who are around us, that they are reminding us of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that the best of our companions, the best of those co-travelers, those sojourners, whoever they may be, the best of those are those who remind you of Allah. So they're not the ones who become in that aspect God for you. They remind you of Allah. They keep you on track for what is that ultimate shared destination. So may Allah enable us in this space that as we go through Ramadan to, to find not just the righteous companions on that path of faith, whether they've traveled this path many, many times before, or whether they are just taking baby steps and uh, going about stumbling and, and just trying to uh, carve out their own path. And to stay connected at the end of the day, regardless of how we embark this towards that end point, that end point that we all are racing to, the end point that is truly in this aspect, the last. And that may we be the last of us with Allah was al-akhir, when it is all said and done. May Allah bless for us these brief moments of Ramadan that we've been able to experience and to allow us to see this month in its full completion. Ask Allah to accompany us into this wilderness of Ramadan and whether we feel our path is drawn out and it's charted and we know exactly what to expect and we feel prepared or if we feel completely lost and in need of any help, may there be alongside us those who help accompany us and help guide us to the right space, but may Allah also be there continuous and may we be remembering that Allah is always there and never left us. May we be among those of Allah's servants who when it is all said and done can be counted amongst the last of us with Allah. And Ya Allah remind us of the reasons and the purpose for which we are to come into this month to fast that for not anything else but to become more conscious, more aware and more mindful of you and more mindful not just of your existence now or tomorrow, but in your existence in our life, wherever it was in our journeys up to this point. Help us to reset and purify our intentions for this month. Cleanse our hearts of impurities. Teach us how to polish it. Teach us to be those of a sound heart. Guide us to that right path. Guide us all to the right path, that right destination. Guide us to the path that gets us to where we need to go uh, and not upon the path of those who have incurred your displeasure. Be there for those who are going through this Ramadan in isolation, for those who are struggling and for those who are in need of your help. Be there for those who were not able to see Ramadan, who passed away before Ramadan. May our Ramadan be a source of blessing for them. May we walk this path of Ramadan mindful of them. Be with those who are unable to fast. Be with those who are unable to fast and bless for them their deeds and actions even more so. And enable those of us who can fast to become a source of benefit and reward and blessing for them. Be with those who came into this Ramadan without homes, faced with natural disasters, faced with uh, occupation, without their loved ones, facing any kind of oppression and injustice, displaced, and provide for them an abode. Provide for them a home and a security, even if it's just within our hearts, and make us of those tent makers and those builders of those homes for these people and sources of respite. And we ask Allah to make any, uh, make amends, help us make amends for any wrongs or harms that we've done, any injustices we've committed uh, prior to coming into Ramadan, and to make this Ramadan a cleansing for us and a truly changing moment for us in our spiritual and worldly trajectories, and to allow us to leave this Ramadan, to leave this Jummah better than we came to it, and to allow us to leave then every place we go from now on better than we came, uh, then better than we had entered to it, inshallah. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم ربنا تقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم
جزاك الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته again Ramadan Mubarak to you all Jumu Mubarak pray that this is a blessed month for you for your families and for all others who may be with you inshallah Usama you this uh, Muslim space has done all that for me what you were all talking about and I my duhas for all of you always because as ever since I've not been well uh, I mean I can see the khutbah every Friday it's such a huge blessing in other programs also so I, my duas for you all. Thank you. Jazakallah.